Welcome back, everybody, to the DC New 52 Review. I want to thank you for tuning in to another episode. I am your host, as always, Polly DC, and let's get into another one of these things. Today, I will break down Superboy Volume 1. It was titled Incubation, and it was written by Scott Lobdale with art by R.B. Silva and Rob Lean. And the first seven issues were released between November 2011 to May of 2012. Now, the first time DC comic book readers saw someone called Superboy, it was a young Kal-El, Superman, fighting crime in Smallville and teaming up with the Legion of Superheroes. This version is called Connell or Con or Connor, who was created for the aftermath of the death of Superman in June of 1993's Adventures of Superman number 500, which was written by Carl Kessel and drawn by Tom Grummet. He started off as just a genetic experiment made to look like Superman, but later on when he would be a part of the Teen Titans and founding member of Young Justice, he got the real deal in half Superman DNA and half of Lex Luthor's, which is so creepy for so many reasons. I'm also going to get this out now so I don't have to later or ever again. This version of con L was cooked, chewed up, and then eaten shit out so he could be put into a paper bag just to be lit on fire and then placed on some old guy's porch to then get stomped on by a steel toe boot. Let's begin though, shall we? Issue number one appropriately begins with Superboy inside his current incubation chamber with early hints that he's not the first attempt at creating a young Kryptonian clone. Superboy is being looked over by his two current advisors, Dr. White and Caitlin Fairchild, who was an early mainstay of this series, who I'll talk about more in the Ravagers Volume 1 review. Superboy is already shown to be quite cunning and dangerous through his internal narration, and even furthermore, when he blasts out of his test tube when he's deemed a terminated project, eviscerating Doc White in the process. Caitlin is able to calm him down, and we jump to a month later with Khan in one of his many virtual simulation programs he undergoes with Rose Wilson, daughter to Slade Wilson or Deathstroke, and one of the best parts of this title. She was created by Marv Wolfman and Art Nichols in Deathstroke number 15 in 1992. She's also seen to be friends with Caitlin and there to be a failsafe against Superboy because things like that always work out well. We then get a glimpse of a Dr. David Umber who was seen getting yelled at by Caitlin earlier and he seems to be leaking info to Lois Lane since the Superman family of characters have to pop up somewhere and there's mentions of a group named Nowhere which were big in many other series like the Teen Titans which I already reviewed a volume one on. Fairchild is next seen walking through the secret Nowhere facility and she meets up with Zaniel Templar, a Nowhere higher up and original character, telling her to release Superboy so he can target the Teen Titans. And if you read this book first, this last page spoiled the whole roster of that team since it took five issues for them to fully form up. Issue number two gives some more insight into Superboy's recent breakout blast that killed Dr. White, which Caitlin hardly seemed to care about, defending him against Colonel Maudlin and a group of guards. But then she has to stop his attack on them with a tactic that we'll see in full soon. She goes on to speak with Rose and Zaniel, deciding to send Superboy out on his first mission, and he gets off to a fantastic start with Miss Wilson, who accompanies him to clear out what's left in a genetics prison lab, as in aliens mixed with Spielberg's Jaws. Superboy presents his tactile telekinesis, which grants him powers from flight to force fields that make him impossible to hurt, and besides already being decently durable, that's really his only ability. But the telekinetic stuff just was super overpowered. Hey, see what I did there? You like that? Okay. Superboy looks good at first, but still needs a lot of training, and when he starts to get the crap beaten out of him, he requires Rose to jump in or get snatched unexpectedly in the classic monster picking up its potential victim for some reason to inspect or belittle so they can then be hit by a lethal surprise blow. 
Superboy's fight goes completely off the rails when he doesn't get the help he needs, resulting in him completely lashing out and overusing his telekinesis powers, which in turn causes the whole building to collapse into the ground, and Rose is barely able to evacuate in time. Yikes. A couple things are going on in issue number three, starting with a wannabe Tim Roth and Amanda Plummer using their meta powers to turn people into smoky skulls. And then Superboy is jumped to in a lava filled part of the earth, and this is when his vulnerability comes into question. Special telekinesis aside, if he has Kryptonian DNA, he should be tougher. He's able to exit the massive hole that he created, and this is while Rose and Caitlin investigate a different part of the area and show that they can speak telepathically for some reason. Superboy interrupts a couple hooking up in the woods, and after fending off the guy, the girl is ready to bang him instead now immediately, almost no questions asked. Not a good look for her. Khan then scares the crap out of her as he shows his powers, and before she can run back to the first guy, a lava alien that was in the place he destroyed and that was tracking him since makes a full appearance. The two have a short battle with her saying that she was sent by ancient gods to Earth, and then she calls him an amalgam of alien DNA, but then melts into nothing and Superboy doesn't even know if he was responsible. I guess every hero needs a rogues gallery and this kind of started his. But moving along, Khan sneaks into a nowhere facility that Caitlyn is in with plans to get information about himself out of her, but she has other ideas morphing into Jumbo Supreme Caitlyn, and these depictions sometimes coupled with the dialogue like seen here always make me double think things with my final thoughts always being I wish certain stuff didn't make it into comics that will be seen by the public eye. Issue number 4 has Caitlin the Barbarian getting ready to beat up Superboy and mentioning that she's part of the 13, a call back to her Gen 13 days, but a surprise telekinetically controlled piece of the floor knocks her out so that Superboy can then be introduced to another original character, director Centerhall from Nowhere, who has some kind of knockoff arc reactor in his chest and shoulder. He tells Superboy that Fairchild was actually a double agent with unknown ties and then gives some insight, or lack of rather, into who his human DNA came from. Even though Dr. White said that he knew before he died, so yeah. Khan is now told that he is allowed to come and go as he pleases by Director Centerhall, which he even thinks is a bad idea, which of course it is, when some Christmas caroling pisses him off to the point of tossing some people around with his telekinesis and burning down the Rockefeller tree. Well, that's not nice. The two characters that aren't even trying to hide that they were ripped off from Pulp Fiction are seen again psychotically murdering people inside some kind of luxury building. Got a bit of natural born killers in here too. And they then have a run in with Superboy who satisfyingly kicks their asses and reports to Center Hall to come and collect them where he then passes on orders that he is to go after Wonder Girl and Superboy is now ready. Issue number 5 opens on Superboy doing some over-the-top training, and then it's seen that Dr. Umber has been caught for being a snitch after speaking to Khan. It looks like he's about to be killed, but suddenly Zaniel uses his parasitic snake ability to kill all the others in the area, and then tells Umber that he works for him now. Superboy and Rose improve on their dislikement for each other, just kidding. And then Caitlyn is seen being held captive by Zaniel and some generic looking bad guy that isn't wearing a shirt for some reason, has a tribal 90s tattoo, and throwing daggers. He's called Batis, which I looked up and the best results were a military base in Alberta, Canada, so I have no idea what this guy is trying to be. The truck then suddenly gets attacked by Superboy, which also has Director Centerhall aboard, and his knockoff arc reactor is overloaded while the crash of the truck knocks out Batis, so Superboy can quickly rescue Caitlyn and hand her off to someone that she knows who told him how to find her. 
Zaniel and some other nowhere guards find out about the attack, so they quickly go to confront Superboy, but they are tricked when he's found in his bed. Classic James Bond move there. Rose was seen earlier finding some kind of secret flash drive that she thinks Caitlyn left for her, so now she's snooping around the area where she discovers info about big things to come like the Ravagers, the Culling, and the Colony. Ah, can't forget, the crazy teens Miss Adigan and Mr. Bryce are seen in some kind of freaky farm. Issue number 6 pretty much picks up with what happened in Teen Titans issue number 5. Superboy has pummeled that new team of young heroes and things continue from him headbutting member Solstice into a nap and then trashing the truck Zaniel was inside watching him from so he can take off. While flying across New York, feeling bad for what he had to do to the Teen Titans, Khan has his first of many run-ins with Supergirl, having her own problems which will be discussed in her Volume 1 review, but for now, a Kryptonian language barrier stops them from conversating until Superboy's powers allow him to learn it, because you know, gotta keep things moving. He then touches Supergirl, which makes her see visions of intense destruction, thus beginning a fight of both fists and questioning, since it's almost mandatory for Krypton people to go attack mode on each other when they first meet. This fight ends up going to friggin' outer space, and then when returned to Earth, poorly attempted to be stopped by police, morons. What did you think was going to happen here? After Supergirl then takes off, Khan starts to think about all the things she said to him during their fight, the biggest one being that he's an abomination that will become a mindless killer, no big deal. He then is more curious than ever now to find out his true origins and heads to Nowhere's Arctic base only to find Rose waiting for him. Issue number 7 finishes off this book and starts up with Rose being thrown through a wall it looks like by Superboy who tells her to stand down or he'll really hurt her. He goes to fight through some guards until running into Director Center Hall with more guards and if you've noticed they've had numbers on their helmets with one being as high as 132. Kinda hard to believe that a group having over 130 disposable goons is not on a single New 52 superhero's radar. Center Hall proves to only be a minor nuisance for Khan as he blasts and dropkicks through them. He then has a run-in with Danny the Street, a weird meta thing that is friends with the Teen Titans. Moving on though, Khan discovers that he's Superboy 2.0 and is being watched by another Nowhere henchman, Fuji because he wears a white suit with a red dot on the helmet like a Japanese flag, which is the country Mount Fuji is in. Rose sneak attacks Superboy and uh, get ready for some nonsense. She's able to beat him by fatally injuring him with a throwing sword stab after distracting his telekinetic powers. Uh, man, he just had a battle with Supergirl taking direct punches from her that sent him into orbit. How is he not more durable than this? How could you have not made him more durable than this? I don't know and I don't care. With him now pretty much down for the count, Saniel and Centerhall get to work on torturing Superboy which tied into the issue number 7 from Teen Titans where they go in to save him and we see Wonder Girl take down Rose which was also included in the last page of Teen Titans issue number 7. Caitlin is lastly seen in the care of Jocelyn Lore, the lady that Khan spoke to after saving her, who was also seen in Teen Titans briefly. Yeah, go watch my video on that if you want to see more. This is why I do these together, so people don't get confused. You know, I want to keep everyone going at a good pace. Alright, alright, alright. Since I stated my honest opinion on how I felt this character was presented in the New 52 already, I won't get into further feelings until the ensuing volume reviews because I got a few. For now, let's just discuss what we got in these pages. Most of the dialogue comes from Superboy's internal speech and it's cocky and smug thoughts sometimes, but it's also full of curiosity and confusion as he discovers the harsh world he was literally created to be forced into head on. 
His struggles definitely feel realistic with elements of self-worth and free will, questioning the world as a total newcomer, learning to face destiny and control it from gaining a true identity. Too bad after this he would have no time to do hardly anything with all the crossovers and general chaos he went through. The art is bright and colorful and I really like that a lot. It adds another style with a practically unlimited palette to the new 52. The settings from top to bottom are filled with unique design. One part I personally wasn't big on were the character renderings. They just looked a bit too mannequin, I don't know. Maybe it's because of my automatonophobia, and yes, that is a real thing. The plot is a mashup of a lot of subplots with Superboy as the focal point, Caitlin Fairchild's presence and her secret background yet to be fully revealed, Rose Wilson having a bigger part in the Ravager and Colony stuff along with the new Nowhere agents getting introduced, Khan's first meetings with the Teen Titans and Jocelyn Lore, Supergirl and the Lava Alien knowing more about his Kryptonian heritage than he does. It wouldn't get any less jumbled going forward either. Just wait for the first Superman family crossover and the Teen Titans stuff. I can't believe that they actually had him juggling those two series and having his own solo one. It got very, very complicated. If you've watched until the end here though, I want to thank you for that personally and to please like, share, and subscribe. Please follow me on all my social media platforms and to please join me next time for The Birds of Prey Volume 1.